Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome you all to this next lecture on this course, Democratic Processes and Social Movements in India. In today's lecture, we will try to figure out that how over a period of time globalization has impacted the political system in India, how it has impacted the democratic processes and democratization of Indian society in the last three decades. The title of today's lecture is Globalization and Indian Politics. As you can see from the title itself, we will try to establish the link, if at all there is any, between globalization and Indian politics. We all know, as so far we have understood in the previous lectures, that Indian politics has evolved over a period of time under different phases. Of course, the changes which happened after the independence in Indian politics, some of the roots of those changes were already present in the pre-independence time during the British colonial period when the overall formation of democratic consensus was taking place during the Indian National Movement. Indian National Movement was also the phase when different kinds of contestations over different ideas, different principles, different ideals were set. It was the time when Gandhi's dream of a village India or Nehru's idea of modernized India or Ambedkar's idea of a socially just India were perceived or conceived. Those ideas were contesting with each other also in the process of evolving. Similarly, that was also the time when the Indian politicians, Indian thinkers and many others who had a stake in the Indian political system, they were putting their ideas on the board in order to contest and in order to figure out that how best we can make our India one of the most modern, most developed, but at the same time also socially most just country after the independence. We are also well aware of the fact that after independence, it was the Nehruian dream of bringing the democratic consensus along with economic modernization and development in India. It was during the 1950s and 60s when the Nehruvian consensus along with democratization of society on the path of economic development and economic planning took place. That dream was short-lived in the sense that by 1966-67, India was grappling with a whole lot of economic crises. That was also the phase when India underwent many political turmoils and eventually the dominance of Congress vanished. From 1967 onwards till 1989, there was a second phase in Indian political system when many experiments within the economic as well as political realm took place. It was also the phase during which India faced one of the gravest crises in, in the form of emergency. It was also the phase phase when for the first time in the central government, Congress lost it, its power and it was replaced in 1977 by a coalition government under the leadership of Morarji Desai and later by Charan Singh. By 1989, many issues came on board. Some of the deep economic crises were staring at India's face. It was in that context that Eventually, in 1991, India decided to go for globalization. Of course, the domestic reasons were there, but along with that, also lots of world politics, world economics were responsible for the kind of changes which were taking place across the world, and India was not aloof from all of those things. We will try to see that how that moment of change or transformation within the Indian economic system in 1991 
eventually impacted the political processes in India since then till the present time. But before going into the detail of those changes, let us first try to figure out the whole process of globalization itself, the idea, the theory of globalization, and then we will see that how this idea emerged over a period of time and overall in what context India decided to imbibe the idea of globalization. To begin with, globalization is about sharper and continuing integration of national economies into the world economy. This could be considered as the simplest understanding of what we consider as globalization in the sense that it talks about the continuing integration of national economies in the world economy. Thus, there seems to be a presumption involved in this kind of understanding of globalization that globalization is about economic integration of the world economies. Along with that, we also need to understand that globalization has many facets. We will understand it in the other part of the lecture. But at the moment, let's focus on the understanding of globalization itself. We have to go back uh, into the history of the modern capitalist system to figure out that how we reached to this whole idea of globalization in 1980s and 1990s. We all are aware of the fact that the modern, what we call as modern or modernity, it emerged in Europe in 13th, 14th century onward. Various changes took place in the realm of knowledge, in the realm of science, and in the realm of whole understanding of human body as well as natural phenomena. It was the time also when a new kind of conception of idea of political emerged, a new kind of conception of social emerged. It was during 13th, 14th and 15th century that we see that reformation took place within the religious domain, that when for the first time the whole idea of uh, Christianity underwent transformations. The whole uh, dominance of church and the Pope was challenged for the first time. Human rationality and human reasoning was on the rise. Because of this kind of new understanding of the religious domain that we also find that new kind of reasoning and rationality led to formation of knowledge system and modern science was the end result of that kind of new developments. Because of all these changes on the name of reformation which were going on within Christianity that protestant ethics emerged or protestant religious uh, domain emerged within Christianity and it challenged the dominance of the church. Eventually it happened so that because of this protestant ethics that new conception of human beings emerged and this idea that human beings are biological beings, they have their own autonomous capacity to think, to give reason to their thought and to rationalize things. Because of this kind of thinking, as I have said, that modern science also emerged during that point. And because of this, a new kind of economic structure also started emerging. For the first time, because the dominance of the church and the Pope was challenged, that eventually it happened so that a new economic system also came out of this whole churning which was going on in the socio-political realm. Feudalism as it was existing in the medieval era, Europe that was challenged and now a new conception of economics in the form of capitalism emerged by 17th, 18th century. The core of this transformation within the economic realm was precisely based on new kind of production system. Now, no more the production was agriculture centric. It moved towards industrialization and thus along with Renaissance, that is the changes in the domain of knowledge with the coming of reasoning and rationality and the other transformation in the film of in the field of religion in the form of reformation that we have the third R coming into picture that is revolution, industrial revolution. Thus, we can, in short, we can summarize 
that the changes which were taking place in Europe in 15th century onward till 18th century, we can put them into three R's. Those three R's are, to start with, Renaissance, that is the change in the domain of knowledge, the human reasoning taking the center stage, reformation, that is changes in the realm of religion, and then finally revolution in the realm of science and industrialization. Because of the, these three, cha three changes in the realms of three R's, that we eventually find that whole economic system, social system, as well as political system transformed. The new idea of modern state emerged, the new idea of separation between religion and politics emerged, and similarly, a new idea of economic development also emerged. This economic development was based on primarily the production within the industrial units. Because of this, new conception of cities also emerged. Those cities were developing around the industrial sectors in Europe. This ultimately transformed the whole societal structure and now society was less of community based and more of individual based. Eventually it happened so that excessive production within the industrial units led to a new kind of world politics where now the industries or the companies who were producing at mass scale in Europe in 18th, 19th century, they started looking for new markets and that's how they moved towards Asia, Africa and South American countries to look for the raw material for their industry and to sell their goods. In, eventually, it happened so that because of this kind of movement of European countries towards the third world countries, as we call it them third world now, that a new kind of world politics emerged in the context of colonialism and imperialism. I am not going into the details of all this because now we have to rush towards understanding the whole idea of globalization. It is just the backdrop of the idea of globalization that I am trying to share with you at the moment. So, with the coming of colonialism and imperialism, a new stage in human development in world politics came by 19, late 19th and early 20th century, we all are aware that Britishers were all around the world and of course, they were controlling India. By 1940s, it was very clear that Britishers cannot continue with the same kind of dominance which they had over the world. New ideas of liberation, new ideas of freedom, new ideas of rights, liberty, idea of nation state, idea of sovereignty, and idea of constitution and constitutionalism also affected the third world countries and they started demanding and asking for their freedom. And if it happened so that by 1940s and 50s, almost all the countries who were under the control of European imperialism and colonialism, they got freedom. And thus, that's how a new economic atmosphere emerged across the world. But still, the fact was that many of those third world countries were dependent upon the European and the American companies and American and European capitalist system in terms of getting the finished product from them and providing the raw material. That was one kind of capitalist model of development which was prevailing at that point of time. But it didn't continue for long and by 1970s, there were already crises across the world economies, including the oil crisis of the famous oil crisis of 1970s, early 1970s, which led to a uh, change in the whole uh, business of dollar across the world and American dollar this dominance was challenged. It was eventually happened so that by 1980s, the capitalist system realized that no more the production processes can be U Europe or America or North America centric and we need to integrate the whole world into one common economic system so that there could be free flow of capital, free flow of labor and free, 
free flow of finances takes place so that we can fasten the process of production and fasten the process of capitalist economic system. It was in the backdrop, backdrop of this that globalization started knocking on many of the countries of the third world and India was no exception. In this backdrop only that India was also reeling under the severe economic crisis and there were serious OL crisis in India at that point of time. We had very less foreign exchange available by 1990s and it was in that context that IMF and World Bank started specializing India that we will give you the loan only if you are going to open your borders, economic borders for multinational companies and for free flow of finances and information. It was in this context that India finally decided to go for globalization. Now, going back to our uh, basic understanding of this whole, the whole understanding, the framework of globalization can be framed into following few points. One, that globalization is about economic activities along with that. So, economic activities in terms of world integration, it is about free flow of labor as well as free flow of capital. Similarly, globalization is also about political ideas and thus you can see the idea of freedom, justice, women's liberation, or various other ideas, they started gripping the world at the same point of time because of new advanced technologies in the information sector that we find that if one incident, one political incident happens at one corner of the world, it immediately moves and it spreads across the world in the form of information and at times it impacts the world politics. Thus, globalization cannot be only restricted or limited to one confinement of economic activities, but the other dimensions of, of it, including the uh, political, needs to be taken into consideration. Similarly, globalization is also about sociocultural practices. As we know today, that may multinational companies have spread across the world. So they have not only brought the production processes to different countries, including India, but they have also brought certain kind of cultural practices because of the revolution in information technology and coming of internet, Google, dish televisions, etc., and social media, Twitter, Facebook, that just with one click, we can spread any information, any kind of fashion, any kind of language, any kind of technology across the world. Because of this quickening of or lightning speed at which the information flow is taking place that the whole world is getting integrated and turning into a globe. In other sense, we can argue that globalization is about compression of time and space. Now this is very important to understand that how can we explain globalization as compression of time and space. Today, if we have to talk to someone across the globe, it just take a clicking of one button and one can immediately talk to the person. It's not, if that's not enough, we can just by clicking a button can also see that person through the video course. And thus, we can see that the whole idea or notion of time and space has compressed. If we have to transact money across the world, it just takes a second to click the button and the money can be move, money can move from one place to other in a second. Similarly, if any idea needs to be moved, it can be moved in a fraction of second across the globe. That's how you see that the spaces or the distance between two nations or between two people across the globe or the idea of time has completely transformed. 
In addition, globalization has also contributed significantly in terms of information technology revolutions and internet. In addition, globalization has also impacted in terms of financial capital. In today's world, we see that no more the transaction of money takes place in terms of hard cash. Just through the computerized world economy and banking system, we can transfer money in a second from one part of the world to other part. Bringing the whole idea of this integration or compression of time and space in the realm of economic, social and political to the Indian context, we find that in the last 75 years, in the post-independent India, we have seen two great or major economic transformations. Those two major economic transformations can be underlined as one, immediately after the independence, unique experiment of state-led growth with social justice, in which planning was central to the model of economy. However, this policy matrix was under stress by 1980s. I have discussed this in, in the beginning of my lecture and in the previous lectures too, that when India got independence in 1947, of course, there were lots and lots of problems India was facing. One of the major problems was underdevelopment of its economic sector, its industrial sector. The country was solely dependent on the agriculture sector and it was in fact overburdened. More than 95% of India's population were dependent on agriculture sector. In addition, unemployment, seasonal unemployment, poverty, economic backwardness, illiteracy, high mortality rate, along with that uh, child marriages, whole lot of socio-economic and political problems were staring at India. It was in this context that when Congress formed the government in 1951 and Nehru became the prime minister, the whole idea was to ensure that we should adopt or go for that kind of economic model of development which can bring the benefits or the fruits of benefit of both the possible worlds of capitalism as well as socialism. It was in this context that Nehru decided to go for the mixed economy model in which heavy industries were under the, were under the control of the state or the government while rest of the thing were left for the market. But still, in the given circumstances and situation, even opening of the private sector was very limited in the sense that the idea of providing the license to open the companies or industries as well as to get the permit was limited to the government and thus it was very restricted. The second important transformation which India underwent in the last 75 years was under the Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Mon Finance Minister Manmohan Singh's leadership when in 1991 India decided to go for economic reforms and invited liberalization, privatization and globalization in the Indian context. Thus we can see that the seeds of globalization was sown in 1980s by Rajiv Gandhi but actual form took place under the new economic policy of 1991. Here I must underline that before that grave situation which emerged in 1990-91 which uh, forced India to go for globalization, even the glimpses of those changes started taking place during Rajiv Gandhi's regime when he was the Prime Minister that he gradually started toying up with the idea of opening the economy and introducing certain kind of information technology revolution in India. In order to understand the root cause of coming of the globalization in detail, we need to go back to 1980s and I have briefly discussed about it, but here I will just quickly go through and try to figure out that in what context India went for globalization in 1991. As I said earlier also, in 1970s, the Arab oil crisis and the new dollar economy emerged. It was during that phase in 1980-81 and later on in 82 that President Reagan was elected in the USA and Thatcher became the Prime Minister in the UK respectively. And both these leaders were true representative of 
the new liberal idea of capitalist development they had the very clear agenda of rolling back of the state or stating that state has no business in business in other words these two leaders strongly vouched for or argued that the state or the government has no role to play in business activities in economic activities the fundamental role of the state in this new conception was that it should only provide security to the people and rest of the things should be left to the market and market will this this decide that who will get what when and how eventually it led to the policy of rolling back of the state rolling back of the state here precisely means that a state is no more supposed to intervene into the market if you can recall in this context what the famous economist uh, adam smith has argued in his book the wealth of the nation that a state has no business in business in the sense that the god's hand can or the invisible hand can take care of the demand and supply dynamics of market and a state should not intervene into market operational it was in the backdrop of this rolling back of the state then eventually the washington consensus in 1986-87 took place which ultimately led to this decision that imf and world bank must come out of their shell and push countries in the third world to open their market and get integrated into the one economy system and as i have already said that it was during that time only that india was undergoing severe foreign reserve crisis and imf put this condition of providing the loan only if the country will open its market for the integration and thus how the opening of national boundaries and liberalization process started in india eventually it contributed in terms of new liberal policies of new labor laws which were introduced floating rate of interests were for the first time introduced and of course the rolling back of the state through this investment also started taking place in india and many of the companies which were so far controlled by the government were now handed over to the private sector coming to india in 1990s we all know that liberalization privatization and globalization in short as it is famously called as lpg was introduced in 1991 under the leadership of narsimha rao and manmohan singh it was the phase now here it is important to underline that these economic transformations or changes the tectonic shift in the economic policy of india took place during a very turbulent time in the sense that just 6 7 years before a prime minister was assassinated in india after that whole lot of churning were going on in india there was this assam crisis the punjab crisis was already there terrorism was on the rise in jammu and kashmir and in between in 1989 congress lost its mandate and a coalition government which was in minority was formed this led to whole lot of political instability and eventually contributed in worsening of the economy and in 1991 even when congress won it won it lost its majority and it's because of the support of many smaller parties that they could manage to ensure a majority and thus a minority government uh, with the support of smaller regional parties which was formed under the leadership of narsimha rao that these kind of major economic transformations or changes were introduced and thus it was a very vulnerable situation but despite that probably it was because of the resilience of the democratic processes and system and the strong democratic institutions in india that india able to manage that situation of crisis ministry of disinvestment later on as we know that after nasima rao we had uh, indra kumar gujral and devgora for very brief stint and after that relatively stable government was formed under the leadership of atal bihari vajpayee and then he introduced the idea of uh, disinvestment on the large scale 
and he formed the Ministry of Disinvestment under the leadership of uh, Arun Sauri, which led to a whole lot of resentment across India also at some point of time that why even the profit making government industries are getting sold to the private players. But it was in that particular context of privatization that all those things were taking place. Of course, the new labor laws were also in partially introduced, foreign direct investment was on the rise and foreign institutional investments were also taking place impacting the share market in India. And thus, a new kind of aspiration, a new kind of optimism and a new kind of understanding of socio-economic and political reality started emerging in India. People were upbeat on the same time, they were also cautious and they had their doubt that in what direction India is moving towards. Private banks and private industries started coming up. The roadsides billboard started changing across India. Now we started getting to read and know about whole lot of industrial production processes which were otherwise confined to the Western countries. Now those companies, those new brands, and new banking processes and system were introduced in India. Gradually, in the 1990s, by the late 1990s, as we, if we can recall, new kind of, because of this new uh, kind of economic system under the rubric of globalization was introduced. And as I have said, that one of the primary condition of globalization to take place and liberalization to take place was that a state must roll back. Now the question emerged, that what will be the role of the state in the, in the Indian context. And thus, it was in this context, one can recall that the idea of good governance or sushasan emerged in India. Thus, the shift was, because of globalization, one major shift in the political system in India was that the focus moved from government to governance. And the basic difference between the two is, that in the form of government and bureaucracy, it is the presence of the state in all walks of life is very important. On the other hand, governance is more about presence of the state outside the realm of your personal sphere, outside the realm of the economic sphere and cultural sphere. Governance is more about nudging the processes to take place and taking the ringside view of socio-economic and political phenomena and leaving it to thrive and survive on their own. At max, the role of the state in the governance process is to provide conducive environment in which the private sectors or the private players can do their jobs. Thus, in the Indian political processes, governance replaced government. It eventually also contributed in ending the process of license permitage, as I have discussed about this in earlier also. Within the Im political imagination of India, the new conception of development or Vikas also entered. And it was in this process that new reference points or new development models also started emerging, in which uh, states like Andhra Pradesh, more so Hyderabad, uh, cities like Bangalore, and states like uh, Gujarat, they emerged as the front runners. And thus, we started uh, uh, getting this idea of uh, our cities to be developed along the lines of Bangalore, Hyderabad, or Ahmedabad. That's how we had the new reference points, we had the new uh, models of development. If you compare this to what was happening in uh, post independence till 1989, that we always had this idea of metropolitan cities in the form of Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, and Madras, that they are the four centers of power, four centers of economic growth, etc. And rest of the cities, rest of the rural sectors are there to provide the raw material to these uh, centers of industrial growth and development. But now, with the coming of globalization, within the Indian economic processes and system and the political processes, you find that new regional identities, new regional developments of economic growth and new regional models also started emerging 
So, Kerala as a destination for tourism or uh, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh for uh, information technology revolution or again uh, Gujarat for uh, industrial production processes, they emerge as the new models. Along with this, the new focus on infrastructure development, new focus on development of roads, the golden quadrangle, the east, west and north, south corridors, all these things started happening across India and suddenly India was everywhere as a new model of growth and development. Gradually, long because of the, these kind of processes which started happening, that a new middle class also emerged in between and its number started swelling gradually. This led to impact on the socio-economic issues and the electoral pol politics in India. Now, this is something one need to understand in detail that because of this kind of new economic model which was introduced that within a decade or a decade and a half that by the decade of 2000, 2004, 5, India had a new population which was fast moving in the category of middle class. And being a middle class, new kind of aspirations, new kind of dreams, new kind of mobility towards the city spaces started emerging. And it was because of this that new kinds of demands for consumer goods for uh, as a consumption pattern also changed, new demands for private education as well as demand for spaces in the city went up. And in this context that suddenly we find that new political parties also started catering to the demands of these uh, new middle class which emerged on the Indian horizon and political parties started giving ears to those uh, classes and eventually we find that many of the political parties which were for long confined their politics to the caste identities or other parochial identities, they also started talking about vikas and employment and giving ear to the middle class aspirations. And thus it was the phase when political parties no more can afford to ignore the aspirations of the common people. Thus, as we can see, this new political economy in India had a few challenges also. Behind this whole success story, we need to also keep an eye over the challenges or the problems which India uh, grappled with in this process. Despite the cycles of global slowdown in 1997 and 2008, which impacted the economic growth cycle of Indian too, that India continued to perform relatively better in comparison to the Western developed countries. And overall, its average rate of growth was much better in comparison to the uh, Western capitalist countries uh, from 1991 onwards till present time that is in the last three decades. Gradually, the impact of globalization started trickling down to village economy and to leading to migration, land price rise and new cropping patterns. Now, this one need to understand very carefully that in the last three decades, globalization has not only transformed or changed the lifestyle, the consumption pattern and the demand aspirations of people who are residing in cities. Eventually, now the impact of globalization had reached to do the last miles, to the last corners of Indian rural economy and rural social matrix. And thus, it has influenced the caste dynamics, it has influenced the religious dynamics, and it has influenced the local cultural practices. Eventually, all these changes in the rural sectors, in the rural areas, has impacted the political processes in the major ways. If we can recall the year 1991 when globalization was introduced within a year the idea of Panchayati Raj was also introduced through the constitutional amendment of 73 and 74 because of which the whole process of governance not only was limited to the center and the state but also moved to the village economy and the municipal corporations and that's how a new kind of integration took place. Thus we find that globalization 
not only penetrated into the industrial sectors or into the social sectors within the cities, but it also went deep into the rural sectors and in the whole agriculture as well as small cottage industries production processes. In short, globalization brought moment of opportunity as well as the moments of crisis in its own way. Because of this uh, globalization thing, it led to grassroots mobilizations too in India. As I have uh, already discussed that because of this globalization in the Indian context, we can underline following four impacts of it. To start with, the first impact was in terms in the realm of social, the caste dynamics of India started transforming, the middle class emerged, I have discussed this, and the new aspiration of the people got into the picture. People were no more satisfied with the uh, provisions made by the government in the form of rations or provisions made in terms of free housing. They were looking forward to getting new opportunities in cities, in terms of getting jobs, in terms of getting new vocational courses or professional courses so that they can move away from the agriculture sector and do something better and meaningful in their life in the city domains. Similarly, in the political realm, the new language of politics emerged. As I have said, the conception of Vikas or development was now the new buzzword. And we see that in the Indian politics, in the last two decades, 2001 to onwards, that no political party can think or imagine of making or putting forward its manifesto in any of the regional elections or in the national elections without clearly stating its agenda vis-a-vis -vis the idea of development of infrastructure and industrialization. So that kind of pressure which is created by the democratic processes in India within the framework of globalization that it has changed and shaped the language of politics in India. Similarly, in the cultural domain, we have new patterns of eating or new food patterns, new lifestyle consumption patterns have emerged and this has greatly changed the way the people in India were living their lives. Similarly, in the economic realm, we find that the focus on GDP, infrastructure, and increasing the size of the cake in order to ensure that if the greater will be the size of the cake, bigger will be the size of the pie one gets. This is the crux of the neoliberal economic progress or growth. So the focus should be, as this argument goes, that focus should be on increasing the size of the production so that everyone gets one's due. Moving to the paradox of competitiveness and welfare in this context, now here we need to be little attentive in terms of understanding the paradox of development in the Indian context. Of course, we have so far covered the whole idea of development as it has happened in the last three decades and the success story or the growth story of India is very much there and it is registered. But also, there are people, there are economists, there are social scientists who are working on the flip side of globalization and the problems or the limits of globalization. We also need to be sympathetic towards those problems in order to figure out that how globalization can do better by taking care of those problems. To start with, as the time when globalization was introduced in India in 1991, there were a few doubts and those doubts are here. One. A uh, famous economist and social scientist, Kal Kalyan Sanlyan, in his writing, Paradox of Competitiveness and Globalization of Underdevelopment, argues that, and, and this writing came in 1992, so immediately after the introduction of globalization in India, he argued that globalization brings with itself paradox between competitiveness and welfare. He goes further to state, that those who favor privatization and liberalization argue that Indian economy needs to be integrated into the world economy. Indian producers needs to be competitive in the global market. Now, this is a very standard argument 
by those who are pro globalization that india needs to privatize and liberalize its industrial production process this production process in the liberalized privatized manner will flourish because it will be in competition with the whole world companies who are producing in their respective countries and because of the competitiveness the market will improve the production processes will improve the quality of the production will improve and also the prices will go down and it will eventually benefit the consumers now what is the problem in this argument Kal kalyan sarnyal underlines the problem is that in the context in which globalization was introduced in, in india in 1991 there was rampant economic backwardness the industrial growth was not up to mark there was there were no much of advancement in the technological sphere and thus in that kind of backward situation if we are introducing the process of privatization and uh, thinking that the our private companies will be able to compete with the world standards production processes it will be a folly it will not necessarily turn into so now retrospectively after three decades of that argument it was made in 1992 and we are in 2022 23 it will be interesting to see that how india has performed over a period of time and how india has survived and not only survived but has thrived over a period of time in terms of private production processes and now we can see that in last uh, decade or so that many private companies are coming to india and deciding to produce uh, in the indian market not only for the indian market but also for the foreign market thus it could be the right time to uh, do certain kind of assessment of the way globalization has unfolded in india in last few decades coming to the idea of poverty growth and reforms now we will try to figure out that how those who are so kalyan sarana argument is more towards those who are not necessarily in favor of the process of globalization in the indian context and thus his writing questions the wisdom of uh, in introducing globalization in a backward economy like india on the other hand we have writings by those who argue that globalization was inevitable in the indian context and it could be used as opportunity to eradicate poverty in that context one can recall professor jagdish bhagwati's argument a famous renowned economist who stated that in terms of uh, doing the assessment of effect of globalization his argument goes that globalization can be looked at the following two ways one that globalization has a benign effect or good effect thus it advances certain social objectives like the reduction of poverty or increase in women's rights on the other hand he also argues that well globalization can have malign effect too which sets these objectives back that is it may put the whole process of reduction of poverty or women's rights at the back burner he further go on to argue that if the effects are in fact malign he said it may be necessary to slow down globalization and trade off any potential economic benefits so his jagdish bhagwati's approach is very pragmatic when it comes to globalization his argument is that globalization of course has both the benign and the malign effect if the malign effect are increasing or surpassing the benign effects then one may slow down the process of globalization and trade off with eradication of poverty and women's rights but the moment we find that now the things are under control we can again accelerate the process of globalization thus meanwhile if the effects are benign that does not mean that we should be satisfied with them agwati said instead we ought to use globalization as a policy instrument to further these objective even more now here is the pragmatism at its best when bhagwati argues that the moment we realize that now globalizations benign effect is coming into picture that we must accelerate the process fasten it so that not only we should limit it to the poverty eradication or women's rights but even go beyond that and try to figure out that how well 
we can use it as a policy to fasten the process of economic growth and thus get more leverage out of it. Famous economist Amartya Sen has underlined three R's of reform in globalization. So in the context of globalization, Amartya Sen argues that there are three essential R's which are necessary for better outcome of globalization in India. And he, his argument goes like this. The first R is reach. That is, the reform should be people-centric and not profit-centric solely. So the reach of the globalization must go beyond only looking for profit of the private agencies. It must ensure that the people should be the, at the center of, the poor people should be at the center of all the economic growth activities. Similarly, his second R is range, that is, of the ways and means of reform should include education, health, and social infrastructure along with intelligent use of domestic and global market. Here, uh, Amartya Sen argues that we need to broaden the premise of the process of globalization in the sense that globalization should not confine itself only in terms of reforming the industrial sectors or the market or the financial sector or banking services. It must also deeply penetrate into the process of providing education and health in, and in a very advanced manner so that along with the economic infrastructure, social infrastructure also met, also should be improved. The third argument he puts regarding the third R is reason. According to Amartya Sen, reformers must ask this question as to why exactly we need to follow the patterns of globalization. Now, this is an overarching R which uh, Amartya Sen proposes, that is the reason as to why globalization should be introduced in India. If the answer comes in the form of that it is for ensuring the private sector players to flourish, then maybe Amar Sen will argue that globalization is not a good option or good choice in the Indian context. But his argument goes that if the reason of globalization or reason for introducing globalization in India uh, gives us this answer that it is for the upliftment of the poor section of the people, it is for the betterment of the life standards, it is for the betterment of the life chances of children, it is better for women's rights, then the globalization should be welcomed. Moving to the towards the last part of my lecture, now we need to do some assessment in terms of democracy and economic transformations in India. Political scientists like Partha Chatterjee underline that limits of globalization are there and he argues that civil society in collaboration with capital strive to contain the resentment of the poor section of the people. Now, Partha Chatterjee's this argument is primarily based on the standard Marxist argument that private capital always tries to check or control people's anger or people's vent. The process of checking the people's anxiety or their revolt against the state can be ensured if private capital start sharing with state using the state legitimacy to distribute a certain policies to the uh, to the people so that they can keep their mouth shut and they should not speak against the government. It is in this context that Chatterjee argues that globalization uses this opportunity along with the state to check people's anger. On the other hand, Atul Kohli in his book Success of India's Democracy argues that India defies many prevailing theories that stipulates the precondition of democracy, that is industrialization, developed economy, ethnically homogeneous, or civic culture. Kohli's argument is interesting. He argues that generally we have this broad understanding or sense that democracy flourishes only in those countries where we have industrialization, we have ethnically homogeneous societies. India is neither economically very developed, it was traditionally of course not very developed and nor is it homogeneous society in terms of ethnic diversity but despite all this the democracy in india
has survived for so long. He argues that despite poor record in many of the above economic democracies has succeeded in the last many decades because it has shared the socio-economic and political resources with diverse sections of people. Now, in comparison to what Chatterjee argues, Atul Kohli is more sympathetic towards the idea of how a state has, or the government, or the nation state, Indian nation state has managed to uh, ensure that democracy prevail in India. His argument is that because over a period of time, the state has shared the resources with all sections of the society in whatever limited manner, but the idea of sharing is there and that's how democracy has prevailed in India. He goes further to argue that Indian democracy is best understood not only in terms of how economic development has taken place, but also how power distribution in the society is distributed and redistributed. Coming to the understanding of caste, class and gender and how they have negotiated with globalization, we need to keep in mind that India has registered significant political and economic progress in last three decades of globalization. Along with that, the deepening of democracy through Panchayati Raj and rise in GDP infrastructure development has somehow tried to bring the dynamics of or the intersectionality of caste, class and gender to the fore and maintained or tried to maintain certain kind of equilibrium between the three and the political processes in India. Caste and globalization has of course over a period of time adjusted with the new market and new opening of the economy in the sense that Dalits are or the, those who belong to the lower caste, so-called lower caste of the society are not confining to the parochial identity caste framework and going by the political parties who are offering at maximum the reservation, but their aspirations, their thinking and their interaction with the government, with the political parties has changed under the rubric of globalization. Similarly, within the class framework, new middle class has emerged and it has significantly contributed in terms of giving new imagination to political processes in India. Moving to the gender, we know that new voices are coming up, including the LGBTQ community, which has completely changed the face of gender politics in India and women's movement in India. No more women's movement are confined to or limited to the questions of dowry or rape cases, but it has moved beyond in terms of talking and discussing here about LGBTQ communities or about marital rape cases or about personal as political. Having said that, we need to also underline that there are limits to the process of globalization. We can count a few here. One, Dalit, tribal and women as labor force, they are still not finding themselves adjusted with the new economic realities. And there where the role of the state comes into picture that how well it will, over a period of time, integrate these three sections of the society, the Dalits, the tribal and women into this whole process that will shape the politics in India. There has been raging debate on the impact of globalization. Of course, the supporters of globalization argues that it's a panacea for all the problems in the economic realm. The critics argue that we need to be careful in terms of understanding the impact of it. Uh, we know that uh, different states, so-called the Bimari states of Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, they have developed their own mechanism of adjusting with the globalization and have shown the path that how the infrastructure development can open the new possibilities. It is in this context that we need to understand that globalization, democracy and democratic processes in India has evolved and it's going on in the desired part so far in the last three decades. Thank you.